morning, Abby. It's Monday. And if you asked a non-American to name some quintessentially American things, I'm thinking that an obsession with alcohol would be about the fourth thing they would name, right after narcissism, hypocrisy, and American football. And honestly, I can't even say that they're wrong on that particular count, because America did do quite a bit to earn that stereotype, especially during the American Revolution. As a general, George Washington always went out of his way to make sure that his troops were supplied with alcohol, and after he crossed the Delaware River on Christmas Day, he basically gave his troops free reign to raid the Hessians' entire alcohol supply and let them get just as smashed as they wanted. Because of this, when the American troops were going back across the river, a lot of them were so drunk that they couldn't stand up on their rafts properly, and so the idiots would just keep falling back into the river over and over because they were just that drunk. Seeing how much Americans have always loved their booze, you can imagine that it doesn't go over very well with them when someone tries to raise the price of it, even when they're only doing it to try and relieve the country of its $80 million worth of debt without having to make their import tariffs absurdly high. But we Americans don't care about logic, we only care about things that mildly inconvenience us. As such, today I'm going to tell you the story of the Whiskey Rebellion. The revolution that wasn't really a revolution because everybody saw George Washington coming and got scared and ran on home because George Washington was just that intimidating. <laughs> Like most of the things that happened in early America, the story of the Whiskey Rebellion begins with America's first Secretary of the Treasury, Alexander Hamilton, doing something that was both a brilliant and necessary idea and the literal worst idea in the history of ever. Since Hamilton ran the Treasury, one of his main jobs was trying to find a way to pay off America's massive debt that it had acquired while, you know, fighting one of the world's biggest global superpowers. On top of that, before the Constitution, for seven years our country was governed by a different code of law called the Articles of Confederation, whose only real goal was to just try and keep the 13 states from, like, immediately killing each other. Among the Articles' many, many flaws was the law that prohibited the federal government from enacting any taxes, like, at all. No sales tax, no property tax, no income tax, none of that. You may be wondering, Molly, then how did the federal government, like, you know, fund itself? Well, the Articles did give the government the power to borrow money from the state governments, and that was the only way they could get any money to keep the country going. What? Now, I hate to trash talk our founding fathers, except for Thomas Jefferson, but I don't understand how this managed to pass through the Continental Congress with no one seeing the flaw in that system. Cause like, if all you can do is borrow, then all you're gonna do is acquire more debt and not have any way to pay it off? Like, Eventually everyone got their crap together and realized that the articles were just generally a terrible Terrible idea. So, blah 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 Constitution, blah 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 George Washington, blah 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 Hamilton. Debt crisis number three. The state governments are in debt as well. So, after the Revolutionary War finished, all of the states were supposed to pay their soldiers a commission to thank them for their service. Wealthy states like Virginia had no tr trouble paying off their soldiers, but states like South Carolina and Rhode Island were in severe debt and literally could not get enough money together to pay all their men. Seeing this problem, Hamilton proposed that the best way for the federal government to help the states with this would be for the federal government to undertake the state's debts as well and add it on to the national debt. Prior to this, the national debt had been $54 million, and the state's debts all totaled up to $25 million, so that means that Hamilton was now tasked with trying to find a way to pay off the new federal debt of $79 million. Oh boy. Also, now there are a bunch of angry bondholders who were owed things for the state's debts and now aren't going to get paid for that and are demanding retribution, so now Hamilton also has to pay off these people as well. And basically, the American economy is in the toilet, friends, and that toilet is dangerously close to getting flushed. America's main source of income at the moment was import tariffs, so the obvious solution is to just hike those up more, but Hamilton felt as though they had been raised high enough as was feasible. Hamilton really didn't 
want to upset America's trade partners because if they felt that the tariffs were too high and decided to take their goods elsewhere, then the American economy would, like, literally die. So, what is Hamilton's solution to this problem? Placing a tax on the production of distilled spirits. You know, those things that make people, especially Americans, really belligerent, aggressive, and illogical. Good job, Hamilton! Unsurprisingly, this tax was not very popular with the American people, because taxes in general never are, and even though the tax was placed on all distilled spirits, the most commonly produced drink at that time was whiskey, so pretty soon the tax just became known as the whiskey tax. Beyond just Americanism, there was actual legitimate cause for some of the anger towards this tax. For one thing, in the West, often whiskey was used as currency. Actual physical money was pretty rare in those regions, so if you wanted to pay somebody for their services, a lot of times you'd just hand them a jug of alcohol and send them on their merry way. So for many places in the West, this tax would be like if the US government taxed the federal mint every time it produced a dollar bill. In addition, many farmers living near the Appalachian Mountains would find it very hard to travel with a bunch of excess crop. So to make it easier to travel around, they would just take all their excess grain and distill it into whiskey. But now, they have to pay a tax every time they do that. And guess what? Even if you are an actual legit distillery in the West, guess what? You're still getting screwed over! There were two main ways you could pay the tax, either just paying it by the gallon every time you produced any, or paying a flat fee every once in a while. Now, the flat fee was pretty expensive, so most smaller distilleries just had to pay by the gallon because they couldn't afford to pay all that up front. But here's the thing. If you pay by the gallon, on average, you would be charged about nine cents per gallon. However, if you paid the flat fee, then you would often pay as low as six cents per gallon. So if you're a bigger distillery that can just afford to pay the flat fee up front, not only are you getting charged less per gallon, but that means that you can sell your whiskey for lower prices and still make a profit, therefore naturally attracting people to your business instead of the smaller distilleries. So then the smaller distilleries are getting screwed over even more than they were in the first place and good lord, this tax was a bad idea. On top of all of this nonsense, the West already felt like they were getting screwed over by the government. They were frequently getting attacked by Native Americans, and the West felt that the federal government was not giving them enough resources to properly defend themselves. And a lot of people in the West wanted to use the Mississippi River for commercial navigation and stuff, but at that time, Louisiana was owned by Spain, and the Spaniards did not want no Moroccans traveling down their river, and the people in the West felt that the federal government was not doing enough to open up that trade route. All of this, combined with alcohol withdrawal, led to the Westerners, especially those in Western Pennsylvania, becoming really really cranky. And they soon realized that the best way to prevent a guy from collecting a tax from you is to just run the guy out of town. Violence! The whiskey tax was supposed to be collected by local tax officers who would set up shop in rented buildings and then travel around to get all their money. So the solution is simple. If someone is nice to the tax collector and offers them to let them use their house as their office, threaten to burn that person's building to the ground. They will withdraw their gratuity to that collector really freaking quickly. And if that collector does still manage to find an office somehow, just refuse to pay the tax and keep threatening them with bodily harm. They'll get the hint and leave eventually. After about six months of this, four counties in Pennsylvania get together and write a letter to the U.S. House of Representatives and to their state's Congress asking them to repeal the bill. In the meantime, the first recorded act of violence in the Whiskey Rebellion occurs when a group of farmers kidnapped a tax collector from his bed in the middle of the night and carried him five miles to a blacksmith shop, where they then stripped him of his clothes and burned him with a fire poker. I'm sorry, this feels like a really convoluted way to torture somebody. Like, you- Was that blacksmith shop the only place in town that had a fire poker? Seriously. Like, okay, I get that fireplaces may not have been super common back then, but still, you walked five miles 
in the middle of the night just so that you could burn a guy with a fire poker. I don't understand. The government's response to the growing tensions and legitimate grievances proposed by the West? Lower the tax by one cent. Well, it's at least better than Hamilton's proposed solution to the problem. Sending in the federal militia to shoot the place up. Yeah, that's a thing. Hamilton was really keen on using military force to end the Whiskey Rebellion. Even when the acts of violence had been minimal and he was being presented with genuine criticisms of this tax policy. He claimed that people were challenging federal authority by refusing to pay the tax, and he believed that the situation needed to be resolved by force if necessary, preferably by force, as soon as possible, or else the government's power would weaken and the union would soon begin to dissolve. While I can understand his worries about the growing disunity around him, and I do believe that the federal government did need some kind of challenge just so that it could be like, okay, yes, we are like a strong federal government, we are here, this is like an actual thing that is happening. I do also feel that citizens should be allowed to express their disapproval of laws, and I do not believe that at this point the deployment of military troops was necessary. Hamilton, what the frick? Luckily, George Washington and Congress agreed with me so there was no unnecessary massacre of Pittsburgh. However, Lowering the tax by just one cent does almost nothing to address the legitimate criticisms being proposed by the West, so as you can imagine, things only get worse from here. We hit our first major act of violence when a tax collector named Robert Johnson was tarred and feathered, and one website that I looked at said that the people who did it were dressed up as women for some reason, but then another website says that they were just disguised. Anyway, after that whole thing happens, law enforcement sends this guy to go and serve court warrants to the people who did it, and then that guy got tarred and feathered as well, and whipped to boot! Fun times! The Whiskey Rebellioners deliberately modeled their protests after those used during the American Revolution, and like, while I can understand the point they were trying to make, there is a big difference between taxation without representation and unfair taxation with representation. At this point, pretty much every tax collector in the United States had noped their way on out of there, so literally no whiskey taxes were collected during the entirety of 1791 and the early months of 1792. As you could probably guess, the economy is still continuing to suck. Hamilton once again campaigns for the army to just go in and shoot the place up, partly because of the state of the economy and partly because he's an ass, but luckily the Attorney General Ed Edmund Randolph was like, um, no, that that's stupid, and Hamilton's request was rejected. So by now it's like August 1792, and Western Pennsylvania holds another committee of the citizens to try and figure out what the heck to do. This meeting is dominated by a group called the Mingo Creek Association. I can't really find much information about these people, but the little that I can find seems to indicate that they're pretty terrifying. After just one committee meeting, they begin taking control of the local militia and setting up their own court and asking that people come to them with tax disputes instead of the actual court system. Yikes! Meanwhile, Hamilton is like, well, if you people won't just let me send in the army and watch all these tax evaders die violent and horrible deaths, then I'm just gonna have to send a spy in to go look at the state of everything and help me prove that the military is needed here. Hamilton then proceeds to choose the literal worst spy in the history of spydom and just make everything about the situation so much worse. The guy he picks is this guy called George Clymer. Clymer is terrified. He is certain that as soon as he walks into Pittsburgh, he's gonna be tarred and feathered and dragged five miles in the middle of the night to be stabbed with a fire poker for some reason. So, Clymer decides that he is going to go in disguised. <laughs>
<laughs> Climber is literally just Jesse and James from Team Rocket. The first disguise he tries is impersonating Henry Knox, the Secretary of War. Knox is somewhat well known for being a bit overweight, and Climber is not that. So as soon as he shows up in town, everyone just blatantly knows that he's lying. <laughs> if I ever get a time machine, and I can only use it once. I am going back in time to the exact moment when George Clymer showed up in Pittsburgh dressed as Henry Knox. Cause like, just... How is this a real human being who existed? Next, Clymer dresses himself up as a servant, and this disguise lasts longer than the first, but then people notice that Clymer has no idea how to do typical servant things, so then that disguise gets busted. Then, the third time's the charm, Clymer dresses up as, get this, an ordinary person. Surprisingly enough, he does not screw that disguise up. However, when people eventually learn who Clymer really is, they don't care. Like, he was expecting everyone to know who he was because he was a signer of the Declaration of Independence and he worked for the government, but like, literally no one had ever heard of him before. Then, when he tells them who he is, they're not even that mad at him. Most of their ire was targeted toward the tax collectors, but Clymer is still ridiculously paranoid that he's going to get attacked, so in his reports to Hamilton, he overblows the hostility he experiences and basically makes it seem like everyone is going to start murdering each other at any second. It's just like a total bloodbath. And, of course, Clymer's reports heavily influenced President Washington when he was trying to decide whether or not to listen to Hamilton's argument. Hamilton was like, Alright, Clymer's saying it's like a war zone right there, down there. I have enough evidence. We have got to send the army in and make those pricks pay their flipping taxes! So, Hamilton drafts a presidential proclamation, and he does this on his own initiative. He does not tell Washington he's doing it. Washington does not order him to do it. He just does it, and it's basically just him yelling at everybody to sit down and shut up or else the army is going to come in and murder them all. Hamilton submits it to Attorney General Randolph, who is like, Whoa there, buddy, slow down! And he makes a few light edits to the document to make it less, you know, threatening. To my knowledge, there are no remaining manuscripts of Hamilton's first draft of this document, which is depressing, because Salty Alex Hammy Hams is the best Alex Hammy Hams. Hamilton submits it to President Washington, who signs it, and then it is printed all over the country so everyone can read it. It basically just says, Please stop getting so upset about a tax that literally equates to like $2 in 2019 money, or else we might do something vaguely threatening that we're not willing to explicitly name. Meanwhile, everything is still just absolute chaos in western Pennsylvania. People are constantly being threatened with death and or arson for helping tax collectors. There's even this one tax officer who had his home broken into in the middle of the night and was forced at gunpoint to quit his job. In general, the Whiskey Rebellioners didn't just hold animosity towards tax collectors, they also hated all rich people. Luckily, there happened to be one guy in Western Pennsylvania who was both a tax officer and a rich guy. I'm speaking of a tax collector named John Neville, and he was very determined to enforce that whiskey tax. He did not care about threats of violence or arson or murder. He was going to collect that tax even if he had to loot your dead body to do it. The thing with John Neville was he was a whiskey distiller. But he still supported the whiskey tax enough to become a tax collector. And that made a lot of people really, really not like him. Like, to the point where a group of 100 people gathered to burn an effigy of him. And then they burned his house down in the only actual battle of the Whiskey Rebellion. So, a federal district judge sent out about 60 subpoenas ordering people who hadn't paid their freaking taxes to come to court. However, the Whiskey Tax stated that all court trials regarding it had to take place in federal court, which would mean traveling to Philadelphia. 
And back in the day, traveling from Pittsburgh to Philadelphia took like a month to do, and the Western Pennsylvanians were 100% not having that. Congress modified the law almost immediately to allow the court cases to take place in state courts instead, but by that time they had already sent a U.S. Marshal named, named David Lennox out with all of the subpoenas ordering the people to the federal court. John Neville had volunteered to be Lennox's guide to the area, and everything was going pretty smoothly throughout the day until later that evening when some people started firing warning shots at them. Lennox did the smart thing and ran his butt back to Pittsburgh, while Neville ran back to his fortified house, known as Bower Hill. The next day, about 30 armed Mingo Creek Association men came to Bower Hill for a house party. No, it's not a house party. It's a freaking war. It's, it's, it's not a house party. They all incorrectly believed that Lennox was still in the house and demanded that Neville hand him over immediately. Neville responded by shooting and killing one of the rebels, and the rebels responded by open firing on his house. The only real reason Neville survived the shootout is because he ordered his slaves to defend his house and return fire. Yay, slavery. The rebels decided to make a strategic retreat and try again the next day. The second time around, they managed to give themselves quite the advantage in the battle by picking up a few new recruits. And by a few, I mean that there were now, like, 600 people marching upon Bower Hill. However, Neville also managed to pick up some reinforcements himself. It's only, like, 10 people, but still, it's progress. Before the battle began, Neville was forced to leave his house and go hide in a nearby ravine, so really, this entire battle is really pointless and unnecessary. My favorite! After some attempts and negotiations, in which literally nothing was accomplished, the women and children were allowed to leave the house un unharmed, and then the other group stayed inside the house while both sides just tried to shoot the absolute shiza out of each other. And this goes on for an hour. 600 men sat there shooting at a house with 10 people in it for an hour over a $2 sales tax. Let that sink in. Eventually, the leader of the rebel army, James McFarland, got bored of this, presumably, and demanded a ceasefire. Although, some accounts do claim that a white flag of surrender was seen waving from the house, but I personally think it's more entertaining if McFarland just randomly decides to stop shooting because he said so. McFarland steps out into the open for, like, two seconds and is immediately shot by someone inside the house. The rebel army responds by setting fire to Bower Hill, and the other army decided that they didn't feel like burning alive today and surrendered. Also, just so you know, all of John Neville's slaves were left to burn in that house and no one tried to get them out. Yay, slavery! However, the Whiskey Rebellion are still weren't satisfied as they viewed James McFarland's death as a brutal murder from the other side. You guys do realize that like 90% of a battle is just people murdering each other, right? Like. I don't know why you were surprised by this outcome. Several new extremist leaders begin to rise to prominence among the rebels. One of these is a man named David Bradford. One day, Bradford and some others robbed a post office of its mail so that they could find out who in town was for them and against them. Upon finding several anti-rebellion letters, Bradford and his group ordered a military assembly at Braddock's Field, just six miles west of Pittsburgh. Six days later, a group of 7,000 people gathered at Braddock's Field to do something. It should be noted that many of the people at Braddock's Field didn't even own whiskey stills, and a lot of the rebels' targets didn't either. After a while, the Whiskey Rebellion became less about the whiskey makers versus the tax collectors as it was about poor people versus rich people and how the poor people felt that they were getting screwed over by the government. The Whiskey Rebellion was just a convenient way for people to vent their frustrations about issues they had been angry at for a while by setting people's houses on fire. Once everybody was actually gathered at Braddock's Field, they realized that they had no idea what they even wanted to do now that they were there. Some people wanted to just march into Pittsburgh, rob all of its richest citizens, and then just burn the entire city.
city to the ground. They also frequently referred to Pittsburgh as Sodom, which is this one city in the Bible that was so full of sinful and terrible people that God set it on fire and let all of the people inside it burn alive. Pleasant. Other people wanted to attack this nearby revolutionary war fort, and then there were some people who just wanted to straight up declare independence from America and join up with Spain or England. Which really makes you wonder what was even the point of all of the American Revolution references during the rebellion, but like, whatever. There was even one guy who got way too inspired by the French Revolution and asked that the rebels find a guillotine somewhere and start chopping all the rich people's heads off. There were actually a lot of references to the French Revolution made during the Whiskey Rebellion. Supposedly Bradford even once compared himself to Robespierre, one of that revolution's central figures. Well, both the revolution and the rebellion consisted of a bunch of poor people causing havoc and demanding change but not actually having any ideas for what kind of change they wanted so then everyone made their own interpretation of what change was going to happen, and then some extremist whack jobs got in on it and started murdering people in the name of their goals, and then soon after that, everything just descended into total chaos and anarchy. So I suppose that comparison isn't completely unwarranted. The city of Pittsburgh responded to this threat of complete and utter destruction in the literal best way possible. So, they sent a delegation to Braddock Seal to be like, Hey, guys, please don't kill us. You know what they brought with them? Three barrels of whiskey. The rebels spend the next hour or so getting completely plastered, and then after that they're like, Hey guys, what what if what if instead of like like burning Pittsburgh to the ground or like whatever we were gonna do, what what if what if we just like marched through it somewhat threateningly instead, because like I have a headache. So yeah, that that's what they did. If anyone from Pittsburgh is watching this, just know that the only reason your city still exists right now is because a bunch of idiots got too hammered to be in the mood for mass arson that day. At this point in our story, Hamilton's constant calls for military action actually make a bit more sense now, although I still think he could at least try and seem less excited about it. Luckily for all of us, President Washington was much more mentally stable than Alexander Hammy Hams. The president was in a somewhat difficult situation. He didn't want to alienate public opinion through extreme military intimidation, but he also didn't, you know, want Pittsburgh to burn to the freaking ground. So he compromised. He sent peace commissioners to meet with the rebels while simultaneously raising a militia. Washington privately doubted that the peace commissioners were going to accomplish anything and was expecting the situation to come to military action, but he still wanted to at least try to be civil. Meanwhile, Hamilton begins to do what he does best. He anonymously publishes essays in the newspaper complaining about other people. Hamilton, you are one of the president's most trusted advisors. The fact that you couldn't convince him to come to your side, and then felt the need to vent about that in the newspaper, really does say a lot about you. Like, okay, man, you are my favorite founding father. I will always love you. Eliza will always love you. John Lawrence will always love you. But you are a freaking idiot. I feel like if Alexander Hamilton were alive today, he would literally have to challenge me to a duel due to all of the times I've called him an insane idiot on this channel, but like, I'm just speaking the truth. As Washington predicted, the peace commissioners were unable to accomplish anything, so the president was forced to call in the militia. After one last attempt at peace talks that completely failed, Washington also summoned the militias of Pennsylvania, Maryland, Virginia, and New Jersey, and let everybody know that those militias were coming. And so were the President, the Secretary of the Treasury, and Henry Lee, the Governor of Virginia. Three men who had all kicked their fair share of redcoat butt during the Revolutionary War. All of the militias together totaled to about 12,950 soldiers, which was a pretty big army for the time back then. It's even comparable to the amount of troops Washington had under his command during the Revolution. Now, it's notable that a lot of these men had to be drafted into service, so they probably didn't all have combat experience, but still, there were a lot of them. And then... Think about the fact that they are under the command of two of the most prominent generals of the revolution, one of whom is the freaking president, 
as well as a short, scrappy colonel man who worked as the president's aide-de-camp, is freaking insane and would later go on to challenge the entire Democratic-Republican Party to a duel. It is not surprising that once the Whiskey Rebels saw all of that coming towards them, they ran away like the tiny little babies they were. Once Washington saw that he wasn't really needed in the field because no battle was going to happen that day, he placed General Lee in charge of the army and left Hamilton as an unofficial civilian advisor. He wasn't allowed to actually command any troops. Fortunately, he was just allowed to advise Lee on doing stuff. Lee recruited the help of another Revolutionary War hero, Major General Daniel Morgan, who led a wing of troops through western Pennsylvania. Everyone immediately surrendered because intimidating army is intimidating, and the Whiskey Rebellion ended without a single shot being fired that day. After that, Hamilton and the local law enforcement tried their hardest to capture all of the Whiskey Rebels, but most of them had run far away by that point. Of the few they did manage to catch, most of them could not be convicted due to mistaken identity and a lack of witnesses and unreliable testimony. Only two men were actually convicted of treason, and Washington pardoned them both before they were to be hanged. Although no one was going to be violently protesting the tax anytime soon, people still peacefully protested the tax, and this led many people in the West to start voting for Thomas Jefferson's Democratic-Republican Party because Jefferson was very anti-taxation. In fact, Jefferson's political promise to repeal the whiskey tax is believed to be a big reason why he won in... The election of 1800! Number one rule of American history. Everything either leads up to or happens because of the election of 1800. No exceptions. Anyway, once Jefferson got into office, he immediately repealed the whiskey tax as part of his epic quest to undo everything that Hamilton and John Adams ever did during their time in federal government. To relieve the national debt, he increased the import tariffs. The literal exact thing that Hamilton was trying to prevent with this whole debacle. Bet okay, guys, you're not going to believe me, but there was a Whiskey Rebellion musical. It was called The Volunteers. It was written a year after the rebellion happened by a woman named Susanna Rousen. And apparently the script no longer exists, but the songs do. Except I can't find them anywhere, and that's infuriating. Hey guys, it's Molly from like a week later, because guess what, honey? This video has plot twists. Okay, so, for some reason, I didn't think to look on the Library of Congress's website for the score for the volunteers, which is crazy, because, um, history pro tip, if you're looking for anything in history, just go to loc.gov, because it is probably there. It's insane. I That that website is just glorious. They literally have all of the correspondence of John Lawrence up there uploaded, so that's great. But anyway, that's not the point. So yeah, I managed to find the score for the volunteers, or at least parts of it, on the Library of Congress's website. But the thing is, it's written for piano, and I don't play piano, and it doesn't have the chords written down, because if it did, then I could just play them on ukulele, and you could at least get, like, some of an idea of what it's supposed to sound like. But I don't play piano, so I ha I really don't know what these songs sound like a lot. But, um, if there happen to be any piano players out there who would like to bring my dream of a Whiskey Rebellion musical to life, I will leave a link to the score that I found in the description. Well, in the meantime, we at least have that one deleted song from Hamilton. Abby, pay your freaking taxes, and I'll see you on Friday.